That's uh, Jan Helge Solvak. Uh, he is a professor of uh, central medical ethics in uh, University of Oslo. And he is going to talk uh, on the title Ethical Endgames, Broad Consent for Narrow Interests, Open Consent for Closed Minds. So if you haven't said anything about dynamic consent in that title, then dynamic consent for static, or no. We will see. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. It's late in the afternoon. And uh, that's always a difficult task as both as a speaker and as listeners. Um, the core of my argument is based on the paper I co-wrote with uh, Jan Reinhard Carlsen, uh, University of Bergen, and Cern Holm, um, adjunct professor at our center, and also full professor at University of Manchester. But because it's late, I have added uh, some kind of apocalyptic flavor to my talk. So let's see. I will start with some prologues. The first from Samuel Beckett, grain upon grain, one by one, and one day suddenly there is a heap, a little heap, the impossible heap. I will come back to that at the end. The second is from an editorial in Nature, 2006. The professional field of bioethics has a great deal to say about many fascinating things, but people in this profession rarely say no. Indeed, there is a tendency for career-conscious social scientists and humanists to become a little too cozy with researchers in science and engineering, telling them exactly what they want to hear. End of quote. And the third is from a recent uh, website, the Norwegian Broadcasting Company. En av tre ansatte utsatt for vold på legevakten var overskriften 26.11. Livreddende forskning stanses og ansatte på legevakten blir utsatt for vold og trusler. Uetisk, sier Camilla Stoltenberg, direktør ved Folkehelseinstituttet. Og så fortsetter hun. Hun mener en streng og detaljert regulering av personvernet gjør at vi mangler helt vesentlig kunnskap innen helse som skulle komme til hele befolkningen til gode. In other words, violence of this kind in the emergency unit of Oslo would not happen if Camilla Stoltenberg could do what she wanted with her biological materials and health registries. This is a kind of self-declaration. I am an enthusiastic supporter of genomic biobank research, but I am at the same time deeply concerned because the regulation of this field is based on unjustified premises and takes place in an atmosphere of hyped promises, imploded transparency, and let go accountability. Let's take a look at the two underlying premises of this extremely interesting field of research. First, the premise that such research only deals with quantifiable forms of uncertainty, that is risk. This premise simplifies the epistemological an ethical complexity of biobank and genomic research to an extent that at best is naive, at worst is deceptive. What distinguishes research biobanking from traditional biobanking? Indefinite and readable, uh, re readily expandable storing capacity, digitalization of a wide range of analog data sources, enhanced resolution of data, efficiency of data sequencing, transfer and accessibility, conversions of donations into natural resources with economic and techno-scientific value that draws attention to the observation made by uh, Arnason, the other stakeholders in this field, indefinite linking capacities, which means that biobanks can be indefinitely expanded or linked into research infrastructures. Taking into account this complexity, in biobank research in general, and genomic research in particular, does not only make it important to take into account quantifiable forms of uncertainty, that is risk. We also have to take seriously into account the non-quantifiable forms of uncertainty and genuine ignorance. 
And for this reason, this uh, typology proposed by Guiri Rertwet and Roger Strand in an article in 2001, to distinguish between risk, that is uncertainty conceived of as quantitative probabilities in a known sample space, strict uncertainty, that is uncertainty where the sample space is known, but probabilities of events cannot be quantified. For example, we are now in the era of personalized medicine. One of the consequences of doing research in this field is that we can no longer count on risk assessment because the patient samples will be too small. And we have to take seriously the qualitative dimensions of uncertainty uh, evaluations and ignorance, that is uncertainty where the sample space is not fully known. And the second underlying premise, uh, already two other speakers have alluded to that, the premise that genomic research biobanking inevitably, if not imminently, will lead to a revolution in biomedical diagnostic, treatment and prevention, and as such will transform healthcare by providing a more rational basis for both medical interventions and organizational healthcare systems. This is a nice vision, but still it is a wet dream. And this vision is, for example, envisaged in the pan-European biobanking and biomolecular resources research infrastructure, the so-called BBMRI, is to sustainably secure access to biological resources required for health-related research and development intended to improve the prevention, diagnosis and treatment of disease and to promote the health of the citizens of Europe. For a theologian, this is a way of phrasing the dreams that comes close to eternity. Here we have good intentions and wishful thinking, but no historical significance. In terms of historical significance, and this is important, the present is seldom the past of the future. The present is seldom the past of the future. Around 2000, many were certain that the genomic revolution would precipitate a revolution of equal size in health too. 13 years later, we know this not to be the case, at least not yet. And in another editorial in Nature, in April 2010, the author says, the first post-genome decade saw spectacular advances in science. The success of the original genome project inspired many other big biology efforts, but for all the intellectual ferment of the past decade, has human health truly benefited from the sequencing of the human genome? A startlingly honest response can be found on pages 674 and 676, where the leaders of the public and private efforts, Francis Collins and Craig Wente both say, not much, not much. So how valid is this premise? And how valid is it to base our legislations and normative practices on a premise that in general and for the most part still is a wet dream? I like wet dreams. Francis Collins, who led the US component of the project and is now director of the United uh, on the U National Institute of Health in the US, said in 2010 that although it may seem that the revolution promised with the publication of the first draft in 2000 is slow in coming, many early predictions had been prematurely hyped. This is Collins. It's fair to say, he continues, that most people have not yet had the experience of having their personal medical care directly affected by the sequencing of the human genome. So while one might argue that the consequences have not come across in the first 10 years in the most dramatic form that some predictors put forward in the year 2000, I think the predictions were probably a bit overblown. Collins is a diplomat. Why does the building on these two fake premises 
move genomic biobank research in a direction that risks violating the normative bedrock of research involving human beings. That is, that the interests and welfare of the individual should have priority of the sole interest of science or society. Some tentative answers. Because genomic biobank research differs from clinical research involving patients by its lack of direct intervention into the bodies of human beings, it has constantly been argued that the risks pertaining to biobank research are close to nil, and therefore, in a regulatory sense, negligible, or at last, at least technically malleable. Second tentative answer, part one, because genomic biobank research is not invasive and because such research inevitably, if not imminently, will lead to a revolution in biomedical diagnostic, treatment and prevention, all will profit from streamlining and harmonizing the regulations of such research so as to save time and optimize cost effectiveness. Second part, given that the risk to donors are minuscule, indeed that the discomforts involved in collecting biological samples most often are negligible, it is not only responsible to tip the scales in favor of scientific and societal interests, and, but it is entirely justifiable from an ethical point of view. All else being equal, the interests of science, industry and society can in fact be equated or balanced, as stated in the program introduction um, of a previous conference where I used this slide. With the interest and well-being of individual donors, because we all want better medicine, won't we? We all want improved health. We all want more cost-efficient health care. That brings me to questions. What stakeholders have actually profited from the so-called harmonization and balancing that have been obtained by diluting the requirements of informed consent through the introduction of broad and even open consent procedures? Here are three tentative answers. All stakeholders, that is donor science and society. That would be the uh, optimal solution. Science and society or science? I think the answer to that question is not possible to draw today. So what about we have been talking about the evolution of informed consent, of this procedural measure. Is that a procedural measure in evolution, or is it a procedural measure in decay? Presumed consent, express full-blown, informed consent, broad consent, open consent. I haven't put dynamic consent here on the list because my reading of that is that it is a close to some kind of expressed full-blown consent. Are we here witnessing a kind of historical dialectic to use Marx's typology, where the thesis is presumed consent, the antithesis express full-blown informed consent, and the synthesis broad and or open consent? Or this is an alternative poetic reading. The tragedy Express full-blown informed consent was a direct result of the biggest criminal offense in the history of medicine. The antithesis to the tragedy is comedy, presumed consent. And in my poetic reading, broad or open consent are representatives on the stage of a farce. Calibrating consent while diluting confidentiality. This is a slide where we in this paper published in 2011 try to look at, okay, what is the relation between these four different consent models? The principles that are valued, the principles that are devalued, and who is the primary stakeholder? Well, express individual informed consent, the valued principles, the autonomy of the individual, 
the right to confidentiality, individual trust, and the devalued principle is the possible scientific utility or the possible medical utility, and the primacy is the individual. What about the three others? Which stakeholders are the primary stakeholders? In all three, science and society, science and society, science and society. And that implies a turning upside down of the normative bedrock of research ethics. Can we do that if the two premises on which that has been done until now has proved not valid or substantiated premises? By consolidating open consent and broad consent models, ethicists are unknowingly consolidating the economic exploitation of donors as well as giving moral precedence to organizational designs that hinder donors from exercising fundamental rights and freedom. In doing so, they are putting donors as well as democratic institutions in harm's way. Yesterday, we were talking about the danger. Are we going in an expertocracy direction or are we moving along uh, the road of a deliberative democracy? Open consent, if not the contradictio in terms, is a moral illusion disguised as a pragmatic device to serve the narrow interests of closed researcher mindsets. It represents the inevitable end of a language game which aims at overcoming the moral primacy of the human being in research by installing the priority of scientific and societal interests in its stead. And my point is, as long as the premises have not been substantiated, it is a dangerous pathway to go. One strategy to end this mess is to recognize donors as already uh, highlighted by Harriet, recognizing them as active partners in genomic biobank research. At present, however, exclusion is both norm and reality. Let's get their biological material, let's get their health information and done with them. At close examination, none of the proposed consent models that is presumed broad, open, have been able to reconcile genomic biobank research with the imminent perspectives of medical research ethics, cordially articulated as the primacy of the human being and his, her interests, be their egoistic interests, be their interests based on anguish, ignorance, etc. But the right to say no has been a key right in research Whatever the reasons, in a number of research papers, policies and guidelines, donors' interests are no sooner admitted in principle before they are denied in practice. Which forms of life are we able to imagine from such a spurious use of language? Must we not conclude that the conditions for biomedical research have changed in such a way that the ethical frameworks of medical research and transplantation medicine no longer enable us to imagine the ethical challenges of genomic science? Or has these languages of biomedical ethics been altered in order to accommodate any kinds of change? We imagine it to be both. However, before we can imagine Beckett's impossible heap, the ethical problems must also become acknowledged as a problem of reflexivity. That is, an ethical problem that the bioethicists or health law experts himself or herself are playing an active part in, because first then may we begin to put the qualitatively changes brought about by biobank research and its uh, main highway now, genomic research, into a perspective where we can start not to facilitate but to understand. I will skip these uh, slides for the sake of time. And then just one final comment and a couple of epilogues. Biobank and genomic research is in urgent need of finding other ways of facilitating its research agenda 
then through a relaxation of the core principles and procedural measures of research ethics, both in the reasons, unjustified premises, unquantifiable uncertainties, and external reasons, the risk of a regulatory slippery slope, are strong indications of the need for a radical reorientation. Classical understanding, says Persig, is concerned with the piles and the basis for sorting and interrelating them. Romantic understanding is directed towards the handful of sand before the sorting begins. Both are valid ways of looking at the world, although irreconcilable with each other. What has become an urgent necessi necessity is a way of looking at the world that does violence to neither of these two kinds of understanding and unites them into one. Such an understanding will not re reject sand sorting or contemplation of unsorted sand for its own sake. Such an understanding will instead seek to direct attention to the endless landscape from which the sand is taken. And finally, being a theologian, I decided to end with a quote from T.S. Eliot's Murder in the Cathedral. They know and do not know what it is to act or suffer. They know and do not know the act that action is suffering, and suffering is the action. Neither does the agent suffer, nor the patient act, but both are fixed in an eternal action and it, an eternal patience to which all must consent that it may be willed and which all must suffer that they may will it. And this is a fantastic painting of Bruegel about the Tower of Babel and the problem of language. I think we have a huge language problem in this field. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan Helge. Uh, very provocative, as ever. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, but you kept your time, so uh, I guess we have time for uh, uh, two or three questions now, immediately. Anyone? Yeah. We can start uh, with uh, Sissel, maybe, if you have the microphone there. Uh, you, you said that you were going to give an apocalyptic uh, presentation, but I also think you gave an apocalyptic example of journalism, because I really think you were citing Camilla Stoltenberg uh, uh, and mixing her up with uh, this apocalyptic journalism <laughs> by uh, simply where the journalist has jumped to the conclusion. So I would like to hear to defend uh, Camilla be out of this uh, really uh, horrible journalism. Thank you. You can read the whole interview with Camilla. And it was not just Anarko Hordalan. This was published uh, also several other places. And the message is extremely clear. If we could do this kind of research, violence at Legewachten would stop. That is for me an extremely clever way of hyping this kind of research. And it's dangerous. And I'm, I, I don't think uh, Camilla doesn't know how journalists work. Well, Jan Helge, uh, I think you are an excellent uh, advocate of the devil, but I'm not sure when it comes to it that you are the best advocate of the interest of the patients, actually. But this is going to be an interesting experience when you now are going to work on our project and you're going to talk with the patients and perhaps uh, you change some opinions, I think, on some things here. Um, I wonder why you are so opposed to a broad consent uh, if it is informed. Uh, do, you want, you, do you mean that the patient needs to know everything exactly what we do with the sample? Or like for our patients when they consent to, to cancer research done by the Radium Hospital or their collaborating institutions uh, under conditions uh, defined by REC, uh, I think 90% you know, of our patients think that's absolutely fine. No, but I think... In, in fact, Wilhelm gave the diplomatic answer. He didn't say it, it explicitly, but yeah. at least my way of interpreting him is that broad consent has nothing to do with consent. Because broad consent and open consent violates the premises on which 
informed consent has to be based. And it, it was demonstrated last week when we had this uh, open meeting on accidental findings, when one of the speakers said he was against, if I understood him right, he was against feeding back information from this research to patients because one could not tell them everything. Because we don't know what will be the next accidental finding. While he at the same time defending the practice of broad consent to recruit these patients for research. And I think this shows how problematic it is to use and implement presumed or broad consent. And as Björn Hoffman has drawn attention to, and what the problem, suppose some of the people that said yes to this want to withdraw. And this is about language, and I think we distort the language by calling broad, open, presumed forms of consent for consent. It's, philosophically speaking, it's, I think it's bad work. We can just take uh, some quick questions now, and then we can go yeah. further on uh, later. It was um, Marta. Yes, this is in fact a comment upon uh, the way you discuss I react upon how you, as a professor in ethics, can attack people not attending this uh, this meeting, and being s and, and being so demonizing about one person. So, so I, I really react upon that, and I think you should consider how you you impose people with your with your uh, with your comments. And I have also heard the interview, and it's it's about. Uh, when this the omkring the hansyne at du skal beskytte, altså det er det er dette med personvern versus samfundsinteresse, og det var det interview gik på. Og Bjarne Kvam siger hævde, at det er livsfarligt at lade personverninteresser i en hver situation tale mere end at faktisk være nogle personers liv. Så jeg synes du trækker det alt for langt med dine påstande, og jeg synes det er en ugrej måde at debattere på. I, uh, selv om Camilla Stoltenberg er en offisiell person, og, men jeg synes det er en veldig personlig måte du angriper debatten på. Så det, det reagerer jeg på. Nå har du fått, og, men nu sier jeg det direkte til dig, mens du er i salen, så det ja. synes jeg er greit. I am referring to a publicized interview. I was not demoni demonizing Camilla Stoltenberg. I was referring to the context in which she was arguing for this kind of research. I didn't speculate in intentions. I was referring to her as an experienced public person. Then I don't think we heard the same interview. I read it, I didn't hear it, I read it. Okay. Um, did you have another one, a question? No? No, actually I actually have a comment. Yeah, yeah, come. Uh, well, you, you talked about the hype. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I was a student back in the, doing my PhD back in the 90s, my old professor said the same about biotechnology. I mean, he, that started in the 70s, and he gave a talk in early 90s and said, well, I came up with it. It's all hype, no problem. But, but today there's probably, well, around 100 monoclonal antibodies, so if you check the pipeline, there's I mean, 500 different products in the pipeline, uh, gene therapy, we just approved the first gene therapy in, in Europe. I think if, if you gave this talk maybe in 10 or 20 years time, uh, you would see what has come out of it. So it's true that, okay, it, we haven't been, been wrong, it's, things are more complicated than we think, so things take, things take time. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's, the technology itself is hyped. So I, I don't really see the, the argument you're making here. I, 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 I don't believe it's hyped because it, it, I, don't, I think there's general agreement that this technology will deliver. The, the, there is some disagreement uh, about how long it will take. I, I, I totally agree with you. And if you uh, look at the slides, I, I put between hope and hype. And I was referring to Collins and Craig Winter 
both of them said, first, they emphasize, there has been an enormous production on new, extremely interesting biological knowledge. There is no doubt about that. But this research was primarily sold in as a research that would revolutionize medicine. And I'm also convinced that in due time, it will. But we are not there. And the question there, and where are we on the line between hope and hype? And I think in public discourses, we need to be open and honest about that. Because trust is the most valuable resource for researchers, for donors, for patients, and also for stakeholders with economic interests. Trust is extremely important. Take the final comment from uh, uh, Zetil. Yeah, uh, just a reply to the to the last comment there. Uh, although I think Jan Helge also replied uh, very well. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, the, the problem we shouldn't be having a discuss discussion. Will this be happening or not? I mean, for sure, some of of these promises will uh, turn into something. Uh, the problem is rather uh, one in the present, of how we make policies in the present. It is problematic to have um, promises and visions inform the making of polit political and legal uh, frameworks uh, based on what may happen or not in the future. So it, it is not really a question of it is not really a question of will this come th true or not. It is a question of disentangling the promise from the political use made of that promise. And because these two things should be different. But the problem is that the politics and science become so entangled into one uh, plan of action, if you, if you like. And, and that is really the problem, not, not the science as such. Okay. Uh, I think we say thank you to Jan Helge now.